Hello students and welcome back to Microbiology 205. Today we're going to discuss mycology. Mycology is the study of fungi and again this material is from chapter 5.3 uh, but we go into more detail here in the slideshow than the chapter does and so you should pay more attention to the slideshow than the book chapter. And also interestingly the book chapter, chapter 5, does uh, go into lichens and uh, algae uh, and algae of course are protists so we've already gone over that and we're not going to discuss algae in this course because that's not it is technically microbiology but uh, but uh, it's it's really more of in something that ecologists are more interested in than than microbiologists Okay, so at the end, I will briefly discuss, uh, I will briefly mention what lichens are, but you will not be tested on lichens. Uh, the only algae that you'll be tested on are the ones that we discussed in the chapter on protists. All right, so let's look mainly at the important fungi now. Okay, so the study of fungi is referred to as mycology, mycology, and not all fungi are harmful to humans, but many of them are. And so if you catch a disease that's the result of a fungal infection, it's called a mycosis, mycosis. The plural of mycosis is mycoses. Now, what's the main difference between yeast and fungi? Not very much. The only difference is that yeast spend all of their time as single cells. They generally don't form, uh, they don't form a multicellular uh, colony. They kind of do on a petri plate, So, I, but I don't want to confuse you. The general fact is that generally you would find uh, yeast existing as single cells unless you're growing them on a petri dish in the laboratory, in which case you will see them grow into a, a round colony that looks very much like a bacterial colony. But generally uh, they exist as single cells. And then fungi will usually at, at uh, fungi are what are called dimorphic. Dimorphic means two forms, two forms. Di means two, morphic means form or shape. Right? Now, dimorphic in this case means, di the, the term dimorphic can be used in many different uh, contexts, but in this context, in the context of fungi, what we mean is that fungi are dimorphic in the sense that they exist as single cells at high temperatures, like 37 degrees, and they exist as colonies at low temperatures, like 20 degrees, for instance, or like room temperature. The reason why that's important is because they will form colonies if you have them on a piece of bread sitting in your kitchen. But if they get into your bloodstream, they will float around as individual uh, uh, cells. Uh, once they're floating around as individual cells, it's, it's virtually impossible to tell the difference between fungi and yeast because they both have many of the same characteristics. They're both uh, haploid organisms most of the time. They both have cell walls that are made, out, uh, they both have uh, plasma membranes that are made out of, er, that are reinforced with a chemical called ergosterol. Um, and they both have cell walls that are made out of chitin. Uh, other than that, so, you know, those are, those are things that are very similar between yeast and fungi. So yeast usually exists as single cells unless you're growing them on a petri plate. Fungi exist as multicellular colonies. A multicellular colony is called a mycelium, by the way. Okay, now, fungi, as I just said, fungi are haploid most of the time. They are not diploid. Uh, they, the haploid, there are, I, there are not two sexes of fungi, but they have something similar, which is referred to as a mating type. So in, in most fungi, in most fungal species, there are two types of fungi, and they are exactly the same, except they have one gene turned on and another gene turned off that determines something called their mating type. So the mating, the, the mating type terms will vary between which species we're talking about. In some cases, you designate the mating type by saying uh, this, this one is capital A, this one is small a or this one is a plus and this one is a minus. Uh, different, depending on which fungi you're talking about, there are different ways to indicate which mating type it is. But generally, for every species of fungi, there are two mating types. And if two fungi are growing together on a piece of ground, if they come in contact with each other, 
and they happen to be opposite mating types, they will reproduce to produce new fungi. Reproduction, they will reproduce sexually to produce new fungi, and those fungi will have genetic variation because sexual, the purpose of sexual reproduction is to create uh, genetic variation, which leads to ph phenotypic variation. And pheno if you have a species that has a varied phenotype, it can respond very well to adverse conditions. If there's suddenly some kind of a natural disaster so that the temperature goes up and you still have some certain phenotypes of that fungus that can withstand higher temperature, then it will survive as opposed to having just one type of that species that, that uh, can't survive. So, so there are many different things that can happen to the environment that will put a strain on a species, on a life form species. If, this, if that particular life form has phenotypic diversity, then it can usually, some of them can survive and continue the species. Uh, so it, it's, it's to the advantage of all living things to have phenotypic diversity. The organisms like bacteria and certain protists that are all the same because they reproduce through binary fission, they are at a disadvantage when it comes to uh, changes in the environment. All right, so sexual re reproduction is a good thing in, in terms of survival and in terms of evolution, sexual reproduction is a good thing. Uh, fungi is capable of reproducing asexually simply by binary fission and reproducing sexually. If two different fungi of the same species come together in the same area, they will actually mate and they will come together and they will, uh, when the, basically what happens is the, the, fung, the fungal cells will fuse together and when the cells fuse together but the nuclei have not yet uh, fused together, that's something called plasmogamy because you're sharing the same cytoplasm. You're sharing the same cytoplasm. So when the two different mating types of fungi fuse together, that's called plasmogamy. And then at some point, the nuclei that are, that are in that shared cytoplasm will fuse together as well. And that's referred to as karyogamy. The word karyo refers to chromosomes. So karyogamy is where the nuclei of the two different fungi fuse together and, and the, the chromosomes get reassorted to give you new combinations. And then they produce uh, structures that are called fruiting bodies, which are really basically just uh, bags or sacs or structures that are filled with haploid fungal spores that resulted from this mating. And so therefore they ha these fungal spores have a genotype that's slightly different from either of their parents. And the, and the fruiting body is, is lifted above the ground on a, on a structure called a stalk, S-T-A-L-K, stalk. And, and it, it, uh, the fruiting body then allows the spores to be dispersed above the ground so they go they can travel a long distance okay so i just said that if there are generally two mating types for every fungus uh, the same thing is true for yeast by the way there are two mating types and if two fungi come together and they are not different mating types one of them can switch to the other mating type right so one of them if if two plus if two fungi come together that are classified as the plus mating type, one of them can switch to the negative mating type. If two come together, one's capital A and one's small case, or one's, they're both capital A, one of them can switch to small case A. So the, the fungi are capable of doing what's called the, a mating type switch so that they can actually reproduce sexually. Okay, now what about the structure of fungi? They form little filamentous uh, threads, the cells kind of divide end over end to end to end, so they end up making these long threads, which sort of look like a streptobacillus, for instance. Uh, but it's called a, uh, they are called, these long threads are called hyphae, hypha, and then plural hyphae. And, and depending on which type of fungus we're talking about, the hyphae may be either septate or cenocytic. Okay, a septate, a fungus that produces a septate hyphae means that it, it produces these filaments and each cell is divided from one another by a wall. So the filaments are made out of individual cells. In a, seno, in a fungus that produces a cenocytic hyphae, it, the, the, the cytoplasms are all shared uh, but, and the nuclei are kind of floating in this common cytoplasm. Okay, now I mentioned the fact that fungi at low, lower temperatures form colonies. Those colonies are referred to as, my, it's referred to as a mycelium. 
plural mycelia. And then if they mate, they produce a fruiting body and then they disperse haploid spores. When the two fungi come together during plasmogamy and karyogamy, they have formed, essentially they have formed a temporary diploid. But then when, when, that, when they uh, produce the spores, the spores are haploid again. So that means that uh, fungi spend most of their life as as haploids except for that brief period of time when they're actually mating with another fungus during which they're diploid. Humans are the opposite. Opposite, For instance, humans spend most of our time as diploid organisms, but we produce haploid gametes when we mate. Right? So, that, so, so uh, humans do the opposite. Most living things do the opposite of that. But there are a lot of living things that spend most of their life as a uh, as a haploid organism and fungus is one of those things. All right, a couple of other terms that we need to know about. A historium is a special type of a hyphae which is used by, plant, uh, by, uh, by fungi that live in symbiotic relationships with plants. So we learned in the, in the lecture on bacteria that there are some bacteria that are responsible for nitrogen fixation for plants. The same thing is true for uh, certain fungi that live in a symbiotic relationship with plants. They live kind of uh, fused to the roots of these plants and the fungi are able to fix nitrogen and make amino acids out of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, whereas the plants are not. So there are many plants that live on earth that are, that are not able to extract nitrogen gas from the air and then turn it into amino acids, but there are many bacteria and there are many fungi that can. Fortunately, these bacteria and these fungi live in a symbiotic relationship with plants and therefore the plants can survive. So a hostorium is a special type of hyphae that actually lives in a symbiotic relationship with plant roots and fixes nitrogen for the plants. An arbuscle is a part of a hostorium that penetrates the roots of the plants and kind of sticks this kind of a bush shaped structure inside the root. Okay. Now, two other things that I mentioned already. Fungi and, and yeast have a cell wall that's made out of chitin. Okay. Now, do you remember from first year biology where you, where you would find chitin? Remember that chitin is found in the exoskeletons of arthropods, right? So lobsters and crabs and spiders and, and flies and things like that have, a, have an exoskeleton, a skeleton on the outside, and it's made of a, a polysaccharide called chitin, right? So if I ever asked you, name one thing or name several things that, that uh, yeast have in common with crabs or lobsters, you can say that they both have a polysaccharide called chitin in their uh, in their external structures. Okay, now you you may remember from first year biology that that the human plasma membrane is made of uh, a phospholipid bilayer that is reinforced with cholesterol to make it more rigid and give it more strength. In fungi and yeast, instead of cholesterol, the plasma membrane is reinforced with a similar compound called ergosterol. And I mentioned earlier that in the, in the first week of class, I mentioned the fact that if somebody gets a fungal mycosis, they get a disease, a fungal disease, you have to find some way to kill the fungus without killing the human. That's true of antibiotics that kill bacteria as well. So the only way that you can do that is to find a chemical that will target some process or some structure that the, that the microbe has that the human doesn't so that it will kill the microbe while not affecting the human, while leaving the human alone. And in the case of fungi and yeast, that thing that we target with the chemical is called ergosterol. And so all of the chemicals that kill fungal mycoses, including uh, vulvovaginal yeast infections that are caused by Candida albicans, uh, and also athlete's foot, ringworm, any number of these fungal mycoses, uh, you treat them with a chemical that targets and inhibits the enzymes that make ergosterol while leaving the enzymes that make cholesterol alone. Okay, the other thing to know about fungi and yeast is that they are decomposers, so they break down and recycle dead, dead organic material, particularly cellulose. Uh, so when the leaves fall off the trees, who is it that breaks them down? It's either the ants or the termites or the fungus. 
if you see mushrooms growing out of a dead tree in the forest, that's because they have the ability to make enzymes that break down cellulose. So fungi, in fact, there are only two types of organisms on Earth that can make cellulase enzymes. Cellulase enzymes, of course, hydrolyze cellulose. Cellulose is one of the principal constituents of plant matter. So there are only two types of organisms on Earth that can make cellulase enzymes. One is fungi and the other is certain types of bacteria. Uh, the types of bacteria that make cellulose are quite rare but they do exist. And then the main organisms that can make uh, cellulase enzymes are the fungi, different types of fungi. It's very common for fungi to, to produce cellulases so that they can digest and consume cellulose. Okay, well then you're asking, what about the termites? Okay, termites are insects that appear to eat wood and, and they can actually digest wood which is mainly cellulose with another polysaccharide called lignin uh, combined the the two are called lignocellulose. So the termites can eat cellulose and digest it, but only because they have a symbiotic uh, fungi living in their gut, in their gut. And then you say, well, what about, what about animals like deer and cows and things like that that can eat grass and leaves? Grass and leaves are mostly cellulose. And again, once again, those animals are referred to as ruminants. Ruminants have a rumen stomach, which is filled with symbiotic microorganisms, mostly uh, uh, fungi and a special fungi called chytrids, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also with some of the bacteria that can digest cellulose, and a few protists that have symbiotic bacteria living inside the protists, which can digest cellulose. So in reality, the bottom line is that there are only two types of organisms on Earth that can really digest cellulose, and one, the main type are fungi. Okay, as I said, fungi are highly allergenic because chitin is a superantigen. You might have, you might remember superantigens from first year. Those are things that really uh, set off your immune system because your body really doesn't like to get that inside. So fungi tend to be highly allergenic. They can cause anaphylaxis. You remember anaphylaxis is a sudden drop in blood pressure that could, in the worst case scenario, result in death. Uh, uh, results in a drop in blood pressure because the serum leaks out of the capillaries so the blood pressure and the blood volume drop. That's something that happens when you have a severe hyperallergenic reaction to something. And it turns out that chitin is very, uh, chitin is one of the constituents of fungus and it's very allergenic. Does that mean that you're also allergic to insects? In fact, yes, most people are. So when you have a lot of dust in the house, uh, Dust includes flakes of human dandruff, human skin. Remember from first year biology that the top layer of your skin is constantly dying and, fa and falling off as little tiny flakes that we don't even notice. And so dust is a lot of the constituents of dust. Most of, if you look at dust, most of the dust around your house is, is uh, cotton fibers from either clothing or toilet paper. Toilet paper is notoriously bad for having fibers come flying off of it all the time. And clothing fibers sheds fibers and human skin sheds fibers and carpet, uh, depending on what the carpeting is made of, sheds fibers. So dust around the house generally has dead human skin in it, which is why it's a good idea to vacuum it up and get rid of it. But if you have dust that contains dead human skin, there are lots of microscopic arachnids that would love to eat that skin, which they do. And so when you sneeze because of the dust, it's not because of the dead human skin or the, or the flakes of cellulose. It's because you're inhaling the skeletons of dead dust mites. Dust mites, mites are microscopic arachnids that eat, that live on dead human, flakes of dead human skin uh, that get into your mattress and in your sheets and in uh, also other dust in the house. So when you're sneezing because of dust, it's usually because you're inheriting, you're, you're inhaling chitin, which is part of the exoskeleton of the dust mites. Okay, but fungus has chitin as well. So fungi will, uh, make you sneeze or they may affect you in other ways. They'll give you a bad headache, which is another uh, symptom of a hyperallergenic reaction. Okay, so the other thing is some of the really bad fungi produce things called aflatoxins, which can cause liver cancer. And then finally, we have to distinguish between two types of fungal mycoses. One is called a superficial mycoses, which is where the fungus 
that is infecting you is just is just confined to the skin surface. So athlete's foot is a good example of that. Uh, ringworm, which is affects the scalp, is another example of that. Versus syst uh, systemic mycoses, which is where the mycosis gets into your bloodstream and then travels all around your body. Perfect example of that is histoplasmosis. Um, usually you got a systemic mycosis because you inhaled fungal spores. Fungal spores are very small and they're easily dispersed in the air and in dust. So uh, fungi are particularly nasty things to have around because they produce these spores that are easily airborne and they are aerosol dispersed. So they're dispersed in the air over quite long distances because they're so light that they float. Um, when we talked about getting, you know, getting a disease from droplet transmission, uh, the range of droplet transmission is one or two meters at the very most. Whereas fungal spores, depending on the on the air circulation, they can get into air ducts. You know, big buildings that have a common air circulation system can get contaminated with fungus if there's mold mold in the in the air ducts, and then it, it can it can infect the whole building. So fungal spores are particularly bad. All right, now we do have to learn, so this course is not entirely about clinical uh, mycosis, mycoses, clinical mycology. Uh, if we're gonna study microbiology, we also have to study some basic microbiology, which is not concerned about what diseases these things cause, but about what, what groups they belong to and who, the, who they are related to. So remember from the, the, the chapter on protists, that the, we now believe that all of the different life forms on Earth evolved from one or more of the from one of the groups of protists, from one or the other group of protists, and so there were several protists, and you remember that the supergroup Uniconta was the protist out of which fungi and animals and uh, uh, amoeba evolved. Right, so the Uniconta is a supergroup of protists which we, even humans, evolved from, but, or so the phylogenists believe, but the, the Uniconta evolved into, the, uh, uh, into several different phyla, in addition to evolving into humans and other things, it also, the, the, the supergroup Uniconta also evolved into several phyla of fungi. So yes, indeed, fungi have their own phyla, phylum groups, phylogeny. Right? So these are the five different phylum, the five important phyla of fungi that we have to know about. So you do have to know these phylum groups. Okay, so number one, the phylum chytromycota, uh, sorry, chytridiomycota. Phylum chytridiomycota are the fungi, the phylum that includes the fungi that generally live in a symbiotic relationship inside other animals like cows and rabbits and even termites, right? So they are, they are members of the phylum chytridiomycota. They're commonly called the chytrids. There's another phylum called the zygomycota, which are commonly known as the bread molds. So when you have a piece of bread lying around and it gets moldy, it's probably a member of the phylum zygomycota that infected the bread. Next, the phylum glomeromycota. Now the term, I don't know if you use this in slang terms, but if you've ever heard this term, but sometimes you hear somebody refer to as, you hear somebody use the expression glomming on to something. To glom means to grab onto and to grab onto and hold onto it tightly. And so these are the glomeromycota are the, uh, the phylum glomeromycota is the phylum that live in a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. So they actually glom onto or stick to or grab onto the plant roots and then allow them to, to uh, fix nitrogen and so on. Okay, the last two, phylum ascomycota and basidiomycota, these are the two that we're used to seeing in the forest growing on trees and things. They look like mushrooms. Um, uh, the, so the, these are the two that we're used to seeing, but the, you know, the mushroom-shaped ones we see, but there are other members of the, of the phylum ascomycota and the phylum basidiomycota that are not actually mushroom-shaped. All right, now the phylum ascomycota includes the cup fungi. Those are basically mushrooms that are shaped like a cup instead of shaped like an umbrella. And that particular phylum contains lots of human pathogens, and so we're gonna spend a lot of time memorizing those. Uh, 
And then there's the phylum Basidiomycota, which are the mushrooms that look like an umbrella. And there are a couple of human pathogens, but these are exclusively mushrooms, basically, mostly mushrooms. I, I believe there's one that doesn't form mushroom shapes generally. Uh, that the mushroom, the cap of a mushroom, by the way, is called a basidiocarp. Uh, so we'll talk about that later. Okay, now as an example, some some of the ascomycota that we just discussed, uh, I just showed you. Some of them are harmful. Some of them grow in the forest as mushrooms, and other ones that don't don't form mushroom shapes. They just live as either colonies or individual cells at higher temperatures. They are actually useful to us, right? So the ascomycota, phylum ascomycota, the members are commonly referred to as ascomycetes, right? So I might ask you a question: Which one of these is an ascomycete, and which one of these, which one of these is a chytrid, and so on? Right? So the the useful ascomycetes, uh, ascomycetes rather include Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right? So Saccharomyces cerevisiae used to make bread and wine and so on. That's a member of the phylum Ascomycota. Okay, here's one that you may not have heard of. Aspergillus orizae is used to make Japanese sake. Uh, sake is the Japanese alcoholic beverage that's made when you ferment rice. Uh, rice. It's a rice wine. You, you get it by fermenting rice. Uh, you can't do that unless you put in Aspergillus orizae. Right, so it's a very precious fungus for the sake industry. Next, Neurospora crassa is important because it's an important model organism for geneticists who are studying genetics for years, for generations, not for generations, but probably for 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, that is, I guess, two or three generations of, of uh, geneticists have been studying chromosome mechanics and cell division using Neurospora crassa. Uh, if you've taken bio, Biology 234, Introduction to Genetics, you might have done, if you're unlucky, you might have done some exercises using in, in something called tetrad analysis. Tetrad analysis is a form of, uh, is an experiment that uh, uh, that uh, geneticists have used for many years to study crossing over, uh, crossovers in during meiosis, crossovers during meiosis. Uh, so, Neurospora crassa is an important ascomycota because it, it's been used for many, many years as a model organism to study cell division and things like that. And then finally, Penicillium chrysogenum is an important ascomycete because it was the original source of penicillin, which was the first antibiotic that we discovered. Right, so I might ask you, these are examples of useful ascomycota, and I could very well ask you questions about these. All right, now, what about ascomycota pathogens? I could very well ask you questions about these as well. So in fact, I probably will. Right, so ascomycota pathogenic members of the phylum ascomycota include Candida albicans, which you already know all about. It causes VVC, stands for what again? Vulvovaginal candidiasis. It also causes uh, ca candidiasis is uh, a disease that takes several forms. If, if it gets into the vagina, it's vulvovaginal candidiasis. But it's also commonly known as a thrush or an oral thrush. This is where uh, an oral thrush is where Candida albicans, for whatever reason, manages to take root in your tongue, in your mouth. And so you have these fungi. You have, it's not a fungus, it's a yeast. But you have these yeast growing on your tongue. Okay, now, trichophyton tonsarans causes uh, a blistering of the scalp called tinea capitis, which is commonly called ringworm. Uh, so sometimes if you have, particularly children sometimes in, in uh, areas where the children are not very hygienic for whatever reason, they may get an infection that's called ringworm. This is actually a, a superficial mycosis, superficial meaning it's, uh, it's on the skin. Remember that the outer layer of, of the skin is called the outer layer of the skin is called the epidermis, and the main layer of the skin is called the dermis. And so, uh, certain fungi like to eat skin, and we call them dermatophytes. Dermatophytes. So they like to live on skin. So Trichophyton tonsarans is a dermatophyte. It causes a superficial in infection of the scalp that's technically called tenea capitis, and it is commonly called ringworm. Okay, so it's a member of the ascomycota. Okay, another one, Trichophyton rubrum, which is a close relative of tri Trichophyton tonsarans, causes something, the technical term is called tenea pedis. The word pedis means foot, and it is commonly called athlete's foot. 
And that's that is a, uh, a it's a dermatophyte as well. It likes to eat skin. Doesn't really care whether it's alive or dead. So usually, what happens with uh, Tanea pettis, athlete's foot, is that one guy has this fungus chewing away at the soles of his feet, and he walks around in a in a locker room with the other athletes, and then the other athletes are walking around in the same locker room barefoot and their feet get infected as well so they're passing it around to each other and so it it was a common uh, a common mycosis that that you would that athletes would get so it's called athlete's foot but that's what it is okay now the the same organism causes something called tenea cruris which is commonly called in north america anyway it's commonly called jock itch now, uh, some of you have a British background. Um, uh, in, in Britain, the jock is a, is a slang term for a Scotsman. In Canada and the United States, a jock is an athlete. It's a, slang ter it's a derogatory slang term for an athlete. Right? Now, jock itch refers to uh, uh, where you have, instead of getting trichophyte and rubrum on your feet, on the bottom of your feet, you get it in your genitals. Right, you get it on the in the crotch, and the reason for that is because some other some other jock has stepped on the you know you have a changing bench. There's a wooden bench, and fungi like to live in the wood because they can digest cellulose. So you one athlete who has athlete's foot puts his foot up on the bench, and then another athlete sits down on the same spot, and suddenly the the trichophyton rubrum has been transferred to his crotch area. All right, so those are two dermatophytes. Now, Sporothrix shenkai is a soil fungus that commonly lives in the soil. And if you're out there gardening and you suddenly get these spots, these, these welts or, or uh, hard welt structures on your arm, that's caused by Sporothrix shenkai, which is also known as rose gardener's disease because the fungus gets into your skin through the parenteral root. And the parenteral root includes getting pricked by the thorns on a rose bush that you're gardening with. And so Sporothrix shenkai is a, is a fungus that lives in the soil that often gets into people's lymphatic system through pricks from gardening uh, nettles and things like that working in the garden. Uh, so that's a common cause. Histoplasmo, histoplasma capsulatum is also a member of the ascomycota. It causes histoplasmosis usually by inhaling the spores. Coccidioides imitus is another member of the ascomycota. It causes a mycosis called coccidio, uh, coccidiomycosis. I sometimes have trouble with that, but it is also usually ha it's usually caused by inhaling the spores. And then Aspergillus flavus is a fungus that contaminates food. It's very common contaminant of food, peanuts especially, also corn and other cereals. And it, it's very distinctive because it has a khaki green color. The, the, myco the, uh, the mycelium have a khaki green color. And they infect food. And if you eat the food that's infected with this fungus, they produce an aflatoxin called aflatoxin B1. Aflatoxin B1 is harmless until it passes through the human liver. The chemical reactions that take place in the animal or the human liver cause the aflatoxin B1 to turn into a carcinogen. Carcinogen is something that causes cancer, so therefore if you eat Aspergillus flavus, you will get liver cancer. Not right away. Uh, it's usually delayed so that you never make the connection between having liver cancer this year and the fact that you ate, ate a piece of moldy corn 10 years ago, but that was actually the cause. Okay, now the phylum Basidiomycota contains a couple of uh, pathogenic organisms. One of them is uh, a rare Basidiomycota that doesn't form mushroom shapes called Cryptococcus neoformans. It, it, it is usually uh, causes something called cryptococcal meningitis. Meningitis is inflammation of the brain, uh, the, the membranes around the brain. Usually you get this by inhaling it, so it gets up into your nose and then from the nose it travels through the, the olfactory bulb into the brain. Right. And then the other ones are the Amanita muscaria and a number of other toadstools, which are poisonous mushrooms, essentially, highly toxic poisonous mushrooms. We call poisonous mushrooms toadstools. Remember, a toad is a frog. And so the, 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 the mythology, the kind of children's mythology was that these things would sit, you know, these frogs would sit on top of these things. And so it's a toadstool.
All right, let's learn some terminology about the life cycle of a fungus. So as I mentioned, fungi are normally haploid organisms. They usually live, for the most part, in the soil. Right? So they are, spend most of their life as a haploid. They are, fungi are dimorphic, yeast or not. Yeast are always single-celled when they're at, at, always existing as single cells. Fungi will be uh, at high temperatures like 37, which by the way is human body temperature. They exist as single cells at low temperatures, room temperature or lower. They, they exist as colonies. Uh, they form filaments that are called hyphae and they form colonies that a, a, a fungal colony is called a mycelium. Right, a mycelium is commonly known as a mold. Whenever you see mold, that's a mycelium, a fungal mycelium. So you do need to know that word. A yeast is a fungus that always exists as a single cell, therefore it is not dimorphic. They have two mating types, as I said before. Depending on which fungus it is, the two mating types are referred to as capital and lowercase letters or pluses and minuses. Unfortunately, the, the fungal, the people who study fungi for a living have not got their act together and they haven't coordinated some kind of universal nomenclature. Nomenclature is the official way of naming things and there are a lot of a lot of professions where they have done this, you know, like all the all the automotive mechanics got together and decided that they're going to name the parts of the car. They're going to give all the different parts of the car the same name, and so that that's so that they can all understand what they're talking about when they each mention it. The anatomists, people who study anatomy for a living, have gotten together and said we're going to we're going to call all these body parts by the same names so that we don't have people, uh, you know, people who study the liver are not calling the parts of the liver something different than the people who study general anatomy. Uh, but unfortunately, the mycologists, the people who study fungi, have not done that. So they're depending on the different strain of fungus that you're talking about. The different mating types could could have many different symbols. We're not going to get into them in this course, but just so you're aware, sometimes they're called, you know, t type lowercase a, uppercase a. Sometimes it's plus minus or something like that. Okay, so as I said, if two different fungal mycelia are growing in an area and they meet each other, they come up against each other, they will mate. That means that the cells will fuse and share a common cytoplasm that is referred to as plasmogamy when that happens. You do need to know that word. And then when the nuclei fuse together, they start sharing chromosomes and rearranging the chromosomes. That's called karyogamy. You do need to know that word. So they form a temporary diploid and then the diploid the diploids will undergo meiosis they'll be crossing over and then you'll end up creating a bunch of haploid spores that have rearranged gene alleles they have a rearranged genome leading to greater genetic diversity and phenotypic diversity okay so the colony produces these little things called fruiting bodies in a mushroom a fruiting body is the cap right and that thing is designed to disperse the fungal spores other fungi that are smaller they produce a stalk, you know, like a little stem with a little ball-shaped object on the end. That's called a fruiting body in that case. And the spores come flying out of it. And those spores will disperse and form new colonies. Okay, so here's the life cycle of a fungus. So let's start from the spore stage. The spores germinate, and then they produce fungal hyphae. You can see the hyphae, these little thread-like structures here. Then if two fungi of, the, of different mating types, in this case they're designated plus and minus, if they mate, they come together, they mate. When the, when the cytoplasms of the, of the uh, hyphae fuse, then you have plasmogamy. And then when the nuclei fuse, you have karyogamy, and then you produce diploid, temporary diploid cells, which undergo meiosis to create a whole bunch of haploid spores. The, the fungal, uh, the, fungal uh, the mycelium produces fruiting bodies like this that have the spores inside containers that are then disper dispersed, rather, and then they grow into new fungal colonies which repeat the whole cycle. This is what hyphae look like. They're kind of powdery looking like cotton. Uh, and so they kind of stretch out into a long line. Uh, so these are what fungal hyphae look like. On the right, we have a petri plate that has a whole bunch of fungal colonies growing on it. Now notice that they have, they have a kind of a powdery cotton ball kind of a look to them. Uh, they don't have a distinct round border the way bacterial colonies do, and they are not shiny the way bacterial colonies are shiny. 
so this is when you see something like this this is clearly these colonies are clearly fungal colonies so if you're a microbiologist you wouldn't wouldn't even have to think twice about it. You know that all of these things are fungal colonies. It's easy to tell just by looking at them. Okay, so here you can see the two compared. You can quite easily see that bacterial colonies generally are round. They have a distinct border. They have a shiny appearance most of the time versus fungal colonies that have a kind of a powdery cotton ball appearing uh, border. They grow to usually grow to larger sizes than bacteria. Right, so there is a. If you're a microbiologist, you um, not only do you judge bacteria, for instance, not only do you judge which bacteria you identify bacteria by the morphology of the cells. We know that, so we know that you can you can identify a bacteria by you stain it with gram stain. You look at it under a microscope, and then you can see whether it's a, a coccus or a bacillus, and if it's a coccus, is it a streptococcus versus a staphylococcus or a diplococcus? You do that by looking at the cell. But in addition to that, fungi also have very characteristic colony shapes. So if the colony is r completely round, that's a characteristic of one type of bacteria. If the colony ha is flat on top but has a round border, that's another characteristic. If the colonies are two millimeters in diameter, that's another characteristic versus half a millimeter in diameter. You know, there's some bacteria that make that only form little very small colonies that are about half a millimeter or one millimeter versus E. coli tends to have a uh, a nice round colony that has a full dome shape and, and is usually two or three millimeters in diameter. And some of them have a slightly different color. Some of them are white, some of them are beige, some of them have an orange color, some of them have a greenish color. So uh, microbiologists have a number of ways that they can identify different bacteria and fungi not only based on the shape of the cell and the staining characteristics of the cell, but also based on the on the shape and size of the colonies. Right? So fungal colonies have a very distinct appearance, which is easily distinguished from bacteria, as this, this uh, photograph shows. Okay, these are all fungal colonies that are quite large. And so again, when you see this kind of thing, these colonies are very characteristic of a, the, these, these, fun, uh, these fungal mycelia are very characteristic of certain types of fungi. Okay, so here's moldy bread. Moldy bread again. The you you know that sometimes if you forget about a bread a loaf of bread someplace and then you find it and it looks like this, you've probably seen that when you you throw it in the garbage and there's suddenly there's this puff of blue smoke that comes out of the garbage. That puff of blue smoke is all of the billions and billions of fungal spores that are coming off of the fruiting bodies from this fungi. Okay, so you may think that if you have a piece of moldy bread, you just cut off the moldy bit and then you can eat the rest of the bread. But I would absolutely say you should never do that because the, the, the fruiting bodies, the moldy part is just the fruiting body that you see. Whereas the kind of the hyphal, the hyphal roots of the fungus go deep inside the bread. Uh, so uh, you, you can never really safely eat moldy bread or moldy vegetables. You have to get rid of them. Okay, so these are mushrooms, of course. These are members of the Basidiomycota. They have very, very elaborate fruiting bodies, fruiting bodies. Uh, and the purpose of the, of the cap, the mushroom cap, is to disperse the spores and create more mushrooms. This is something that they used to call a fairy circle. In fact, what's happened here is this giant circle of mushrooms. These are the fruiting bodies that occurred after two different fungal mycelia mated underneath the ground. And fungal uh, mycelia in nature can be huge. They can take up uh, thousands of square meters, the fungal mycelium. So if you look closely at the dirt, you'll see little hyphae under the dirt for many, many meters, maybe even a kilometer or something like that. And if you have two of these colonies where they come together, they will form fruiting bodies. So this, what this fairy circle represents is there were two very large fungal uh, colonies, two very large fungal mycelia underground. And this circle is just the area where the two different mating types of the same fungus overlapped and mated and then produced these fruiting bodies for the purpose of disp dispersing the spores.
All right, so as I said already, mycology is the study of fungus and fungal, myco and fungal mycoses. A mycosis is a fungal disease. Mycosis is the plural. And so mycoses are diseases caused by fungi. fungi. Hypha, or hyphae, plural, is a thread-like filament that fungus, fungal colonies produce. A septate hyphae is where the filaments have walls in between, so the cells are kept separate versus a sinusitic hyphae, which is where the, uh, which is where the, uh, fu the, the, there's a common cytoplasm and the nuclei are, are all just sort of floating around in the common cytoplasm. They're, they're very, very similar to a plasmodi plasmodial slime mold, which we discussed in the protist section. Okay, so the term mycelium refers to a colony of fungus. Dimorphic means existing at a sing as single cells at high temperatures and as, and as mycelia at low temperatures. And the fruiting body is the structure that contains the haploid spores that's produced after mating and then you disperse them. Okay, so here we have mold. And then if you look at the mold close up, you'll see that it's eventually producing hyphae like this. All right, so here is a septate hyphae where we have walls. The, the Latin word for wall is septum. Right? So you may remember from anatomy class or from biology 120 that the, you know, the, the wall that divides the left and right ventricles of the heart is called the sept ventricular septum and the, and the atrial septum. So the word septum is, means is a Latin word for wall or to divide. Right? So a septate hyphae is produced by some, some types of fungus and all of the cells are kept separate by these cell walls versus on the right we have a sinusitic hyphae where all the, there's a common cytoplasm and all the nuclei are just sort of in the same cytoplasm together. Okay, a fruiting body is the structure made to produce spores. Okay, so here we these most of what you see this powdery looking stuff that that are the fungal colonies are actually the spores, mostly the fruiting bodies rather. Okay, so here's a close up. This is a false color scanning electron microscope image of uh, a conidia, which is a type of a fruiting body for one type of fungus. So these are all spores that are kind of come going to come flying out. Here's another fruiting body for another type of fungus, and here's a fruiting body for uh, Amanita muscaria, which is a deadly type of a toadstool. All right, so as we said, some of the fungi are helpful to us, only a few are dangerous. They are decomposers. Right? Many live in a symbiotic relationship with plant roots, particularly members of the phylum Glomericata. A hostorium is a fungal filament that penetrates plant roots, and the piece that, it, that the hostorium sticks inside the plant root is called an arbuscle. Uh, it's a microscopic bush. Arbuscle means little, literally translates as little, little bush. Uh, some live in a symbiote. Some fungi, particularly the chytrids, live in a symbiotic relationship inside the guts of insects, as well as like termites, as well as other farm animals and things that are ruminants. Uh, they have ergosterol instead of cholesterol in their, in their plasma membrane, which we target with antifungal drugs. They have, the cell wall also contains chit uh, chitin, which is a polysaccharide. They have that in contact with the arthropods, which also have chitin in their exoskeleton. Fungi do not have an exoskeleton. They just have a, what's called a cell wall, not an exoskeleton. And many of them produce toxins. Now, the, many of the toxins that are produced are produced in order to prevent the fungi from uh, prevent competition for nutrients in the soil from other plants and other, other microbes. So the fact that, that uh, uh, penicillin chrysogenium produces penicillin, penicillin, the reason it does that, if a fungus can have a reason for doing something, the reason for doing that is to kill bacteria in the same area to prevent the bacteria from competing for the same nutrients that the fungus is competing for. So that's the purpose. Uh, but that's why they do it. And so many Many fungi produce toxic substances that kill humans that eat the fungus, that kill animals that eat the fungus, but also that kill bacteria that are competing for the, competing for the same food as the fungus. Okay, so here's a, here is cholesterol versus ergosterol. You see they're very closely related, but they're not quite the same. Uh, they're, apparently they are different enough that there are certain chemicals that can target the enzymes that make ergosterol, but do not affect the, the enzymes that make cholesterol.
Okay, so what do what do mushrooms have in common with insects and and crustaceans? They all have chitin. That's the, the well. There are sev several similarities. So if I ask you about this, I would ask for several. One is that all three of them are eukaryotes, right? All three of them descended from the Unicata, and all three of them have chitin in their uh, in their outer in their outer layers. All right, so a general mycosis, a general mycosis is where it affects your whole body, probably because you inhaled spores and it got into the lungs and then into the blood supply. It causes a strong allergic reaction. And also chitin is very allergic to begin with. As I said, a superficial mycosis is just where you have a fungus that lives on living or dead keratinized skin cells on the surface of the skin. Some of them will grow on dead skin. Some of them are aggressive enough uh, some of them are aggressive enough that they will start eating away at live skin, and that's what happens with jock itch and ringworm and athlete's foot. Some of them spo spoil food. They are very important to the world economy because they are. we have to keep them out of the food because they spoil food. Uh, one of the interesting things about fungus is that they require less water to grow than bacteria, for instance, other spoilers. So if you have moist food, it can be spoiled by, it's probably going to be spoiled by bacteria unless you do something like refrigerate it or freeze it or dehydrate it to get the water out. But if you have relatively dry food, uh, it's probably fungus that's going to spoil it and bacteria will not. So imagine this. Imagine you had a jar of honey, right? And you open, you take the lid off the jar of honey, and then you leave it open for a month. Do you think you'll have bacterial colonies growing on the surface of the honey, or will you have fungal colonies growing on the surface? It, it, it will go moldy because the fungi, honey has very little water in it. it that's why it's so viscous. And so it's viscous enough, and it has a low enough water content that bacteria cannot grow in it, but fungi can. Um, so fungi tend to grow slower than bacteria, but they can grow in uh, they can grow on food sources that contain less water. So there are many places where you would see uh, if there's a competition for food between bacteria and fungus, the bacteria if there's enough water, the bacteria will usually win because they divide much faster than fungi. But if there's very little water, then the bacteria can't grow, but the fungi can, and so that's usually what happens. Okay, so these food spoilage fungi produce toxins, which cause liver cancer and other things. And fungi are among the only things that can hydrolyze cellulose. Right? So now one of the interesting things is that um, inside your house, the walls that are on the inside of your house are made of something called drywall. And behind the drywall, you have wood. Drywall is a layer of plaster that's surrounded by two layers of paper, has two layers, a, a layer of paper on either side of the plaster. Paper is made primarily out of cellulose. So if, that, if the drywall is dry, it, it, the, cell, uh, the fungi cannot grow on it. But if the drywall gets damp for any prolonged period of time, then fungi can grow on it and cause mold in your house. And so that's a very dangerous situation. Another place where you'll find mold growing often is in used bookstores, because if you're a, if you're a librarian, you know all about the fact that that books have to be kept dry, or they will uh, pick up mold. They will get moldy. Right? If you run a used bookstore. Often people have, you know, been keeping their books in a damp place and then they want to get rid of them. So they sell them or give them to the bookstore. And then suddenly you've got fungi in the bookstore. And so most used bookstores are, you know, they're filled with fungi. You walk, if you have an allergy to fungus, you walk into a used bookstore, it'll just hit you. Suddenly your eyes will start to burn or something like that. It's very difficult to keep the fungal levels down inside a used bookstore. So that's one of the reasons why fungi are a menace in certain places where other organisms are not. Anywhere that you find cellulose, there are very few things in the world that can break down cellulose, but fungi are one of them. So fungi will rot your house if you have damp drywall in your walls. If you have damp wood in your house, the fungus will rot that. And if you have moldy or if you have damp books, then fungus will rot that as well. All right, so histoplasmosis is an example of a general mycosis where you inhale spores, 
these are the areas where histoplasmosis is endemic, by the way, and the sort of in the in the eastern and southeastern United States is an area where you have to worry about inhaling spores from histoplasmosis. If you work with birds, the uh, histoplasmosis spores are often in bird droppings, not just domesticated birds like chicken, but pigeons uh, and bats. So you have to worry about bird and bat droppings uh, as being sources of histoplasmosis. Okay, so fungal spores are meant to spread very easily. They are almost impossible to get rid of. So this is one of the cup fungi. This is one of the Ascomycota cup fungi. You can just see when it gets to, to a certain ripeness, it just goes poof and it sprays these fungi uh, spores, fungal spores into the atmosphere that can travel long distances on the, on the wind, travel long distances in the air. Okay, this is uh, an escape hatch on the Russian space station, the Mir space station. The, the Russian space, the, the Soviets had, uh, and then later the Russians had a space station in orbit around the Earth for many years. And it, it was very difficult once the, the it's, they, they go to great lengths to avoid getting, getting fungus in, in, in the space stations and other places, because once you get it, it's impossible to get rid of. And at one point, the Mir space station became impossible to live in any longer because it was completely clogged with fungus. Uh, and so the, the cosmonauts that went up to the Russian space station had a difficult time breathing and things like that because there was fungus growing all over the place. The fungus grows because the humidity was too high. Uh, it's probably going to happen to the International Space Station as well eventually. It just hasn't had a chance to happen yet. Uh, and maybe they learn from the, from the Soviet example to try and keep the humidity under better control so that that doesn't happen. But nevertheless, the Mir space station became completely clogged with fungus and it was very difficult for them to, to keep functioning in it. Okay, so here's the Mir space station. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. It was put up there by the Soviet Union. Those of you that are familiar with history, and again, once again, I will never ask you about this on an exam. This is just for interest. This is just for fun. Uh, the Russians, the Soviets put the Mir space station up in orbit around Earth, and they were there conducting experiments for a long time. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and suddenly they didn't have the Soviet Union anymore. It was just Russia and Ukraine and all the other countries. And most of the space program in the Soviet Union was, was divided between Russia and Ukraine. And suddenly they were two separate countries. And so they're arguing about who's going to pay for the space station. Okay, so they usually, by the way, this they usually this is a, called a clean room when you're putting together satellites and things. You have people that are dressed from head to foot in these plastic outfits to prevent fungal spores from traveling from them into the space equipment. Because if it's if it's a space station, for instance, that has an oxygen atmosphere, you'll never get rid of it. So the clean room is to prevent fungal spores from getting into the space equipment, also to prevent dust and any anything else from getting into the equipment. Uh, but eventually it's impossible to keep, you know, humans are not sanitary enough that you can get rid of all the fungal spores that a human might carry into space. Okay, so this poor guy, Sergei Krikalev, uh, is kind of an interesting story because he is, he is sometimes, again, this is just for fun. This is, I would never ask you this, but just for fun. This poor sometimes referred to as the Soviet Union's last citizen because he went up to the Mir space station and he got stuck up there when the Soviet Union fell apart and then had to spend another year in the space station while Russia and Ukraine argued about who was going to pay to bring him back. Uh, that was kind of a stressful situation, I would imagine. Uh, and so he had to stay up in this space station breathing fungal spores for a very long time. I think he might even have the record of the longest person in space. So that's kind of that was kind of an in interesting chapter in human history. But the main problem with the Mir space station was that it was so choked with fungus that it became difficult to work in, in that environment anymore. Okay, so fungal spores are easily dispersed and very difficult to get rid of. Okay, what's the difference between a systemic mycosis or a general mycosis versus a superficial mycosis? I'm going to show you some disturbing images, so be beware. On the left, we have ringworm, which is a scalp infection, and on the right, we have athlete's foot. 
These are caused by dermatophyte fungi. Dermatophyte fungi, we'll learn the names in a minute. So dermatophytes are eating the live skin. Uh, most fungi can grow on dead skin if it's moist enough, but some of them are aggressive enough that they can grow on live skin. They can start decomposing and eating the live skin. Food spoilage, obviously. Right, this is uh, the one on the top is Aspergillus nigillans, which is a relatively harmless fungus. It's only dangerous if you eat enough of it. And at the bottom, we have this khaki green colored fungus, which is Aspergillus flavus, which is causes liver cancer if you eat it. Right, so Aspergillus flavus is distinguishable from other fungi by the khaki color. Khaki, of course, is that mixture of brown and green that soldiers wear on soldier uniforms and things is called khaki. Okay, so here's some Aspergillus flavus growing in peanuts. So this contaminates peanuts as well as corn and other cereals, and it can cause liver cancer if you eat these things. If you Generally, if you wash the food off, that's not good enough to get rid of all the aflatoxins, so you can still get liver cancer from it. So that you have, if this happens, you have no choice but to throw the food away to, to destroy it. Okay, and because fungi are such a problem in this respect, that's one of the main things that health inspectors look for when they're inspecting restaurants. Uh, so I've mentioned to you, I've mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again. If you're interested in a in a career that that's related to microbiology, you can become a a health inspector. British Columbia Institute of Technology (BCIT) has a program that's called the Environmental Hygiene Program, and it trains people to be health inspectors. Getting your certificate as a health inspector doesn't guarantee you a job as a health inspector because it depends if how many how many vacancies they may have, but at least you'd be qualified. So that's how you would get qualified to be a health inspector. You can't get the job unless you have the qualifications, but having the qualifications doesn't guarantee that you get the job, of course. But that is one of the careers you can go into. Uh, if you want to ask somebody who knows about that program, uh, you can talk to Ankar Baines, Dr. Baines, who's one of the other biology instructors here at Columbia, because he used to teach in that program. All right, now these are Amanita muscaria, which are a, a deadly form of, of mushrooms. They're members of the Basidiomycota. Um, and you see them around and they're deadly. And I don't know why, um, I don't know why the, 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 the cartoonists who made the Smurfs, why, why cartoonists who make children's stories keep on using the Amanita muscaria mushroom uh, as the home for Smurfs and, and gnomes and things like that. You know, all of these children's books have gnomes and, and, and other mythical creature, mythical beings, little mythical beings living inside these poisonous toadstools. Uh, and so then that, uh, you know, there's always a certain number of children who'll see that and then go, go looking for the Smurf, go looking for the gnomes to see if there are any gnomes living inside, and then they can get poisoned by eating these mushrooms, these uh, toadstools. Okay, so as I said, you have drywall in your house. If you have a flood and then the water resides, the drywall will generally be wet enough that fungus can grow on it. The first thing you need to do is get some of those giant drying machines in there and start heating it up and blowing the moisture out. If you're lucky, you will get all the moisture out and you'll dry out the walls and the carpets fast enough so that mold will not grow. If you're unlucky, you get this. You get moldy walls and then there's really no way to get rid of the, the fungal spores. Okay, so here's another little story. I will not ask you about this. This is just a historical anecdote about Vancouver. Uh, if you're in Vancouver, you might be interested in this. We had a building boom in the early 1990s, the late 1980s, early 1990s, where uh, a lot of people moved into Vancouver and, they, and so the developers started building condominiums for them all to live. So they, they started, Vancouver started out as a small city with lots of mainly houses and then as the population grew in the early 90s late 80s early 90s they started tearing down the houses and building condominiums instead there was so so much demand for builders that a lot of people came into the province came to Vancouver who who were used to building in other drier areas as you've probably noticed Vancouver is a very damp city we we have a lot of rain but these people were trained to build a lot of some of them were trained to build condominiums in drier climates where you didn't have to worry so much about leaks. 
And so they built a lot of condominiums that came to be known as leaky condominiums, leaky condominiums. And these people built these things and then they disappeared. They put their money in Swiss bank accounts and then people moved into these condominiums. They leaked and then they got moldy. And when the people who owned the condominiums went to sue the builders, they found that they couldn't find them anymore. They disappeared off into the ether. Uh, and so it was a it, it was a kind of a sad chapter in Vancouver's history that in the 90s we had all of these substandard, faulty, leaky condominiums built, and people were already living in them, and so they had no place to go. And so what en what ended up happening is the poor people who bought these leaky condominiums had to pay more builders to come and while they were still living inside tear the outside of the building off while the people are still living inside and then tear out as best they could pull out and tear out and scrub out all of the mold and then put a new wall on the outside and meanwhile when you tear the walls off the outside the moisture gets in again and so this is uh, you know it was ridiculous and it still is ridiculous that this actually happened uh, the laws should have been more strict about regulating builders and so on and and what happened was that the you know the people who bought these condominiums had to pay thousands and thousands more probably 20 or 30 you, you, at the time condominiums were selling for about 100 120 thousand dollars they're obviously much more now but this was 30 years ago, and uh, people would buy a condominium for $120,000, and then suddenly they'd discover there's mold in the in between the walls, and they'd have to, and then the whole condominium unit would have to be rebuilt from the outside, and then everyone would have to pay 20 or 30 thousand dollars more for that building process, which is not even particularly good because you can't really tear the wall off and get rid of all the fungus. It's it's much simpler just to tear it down and build a new building but they'd already paid for the buildings. And so that, anyway, that was a shameful chapter in the history of Vancouver where people's lives were badly disrupted by bad builders and by fungus, by fungus. Okay, so if you're trying to get rid of the fungus, you have to be dressed up like this. Notice that this man who's tearing out the drywall has a breather. He has a respirator on that's supposed to filter out the fungal spores so that he doesn't inhale them and get a systemic mycosis, right? So fungi are very dangerous because of the spores. And so when you start tearing the walls out like this, you have to be, you have to have proper protective equipment, personal protective equipment to avoid inhaling the spores. And the truth is, it's actually, you can never really get rid of it. So once you've had your your house or your interior space has been destroyed like this by fungus you can never really get rid of it you'll pay somebody a lot of money to tear the drywall out and put new drywall in but they'll there will still be spores in the wood behind it and so if you ever get moisture in there again there'll be a lot of fungus growing very quickly it really it's probably less trouble to simply tear down the house and start again build another one Okay, just a word about the fungal phylogeny that we just discussed. Right, so remember that we are, that the fungi arrived uh, 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 evolved from the protist supergroup Uniconta. So did humans. So we have a we share a common ancestry uh, as well as all the animals. We share a common ancestry with fungi. So we are humans, for example, are much more closely related to fungus than we are to to uh, uh, algae, for instance. Okay, so as we mentioned, the the chytrids uh, are they they the the characteristics of the five important phyla. So the chytrid phylum chytridiomycota, commonly known as the chytrids, are they they are characteristic because they produce something called zoospores. The zoospores are fungal spores that actually have a flagellum on the end, so they can swim. Right, so they they are the ones that live in the guts of insects. They live in the guts of insects, for instance. Uh, inside termites and so on. The zygomycota, they are the ones that, that you see growing on bread. The glomeromycota are symbiotic with plant roots. The ascomycota are the cup fungi, but there's some that don't form cup shapes. They just form regular uh, mycelia. And then the basidiomycota are the mushrooms that we are used to seeing growing on, in the forest with mushroom caps. Okay, so these two, the ascomycota and the basidiomycota, contain the majority of the pathogens, the fungal pathogens. Uh, 
starting with the chytridio micata, the chytrids, they are the ones that live in the guts of termites as well as the guts of cows and things like that. Here you see a, a zoospore, so there's the fungal spore and it's got, you can see it's got flagella on the end, so it has the ability to swim around. Okay, so just as an aside, termites are the things that chew up trees and then regurgitate the wood pulp and make a nest. They are, if you remember from your biology 110, termites are kind of interesting because they're one of the few landscape architects, uh, uh, landscape engineers, ecological engineers they're called that actually radically change the landscape where they are. So these, these hideous things are, uh, termite mounds found in Australia where the termites are very aggressive so they've been they've been chewing up all the trees and building these massive nests where whole areas are whole areas of the landscape are destroyed by them but i will not ask you about that on the test on microbiology the only thing you need to know is that they are they are able to do this they are able to digest wood and turn wood fiber into wood pulp because they have chytrids in their in their gut they have chytrids living symbiotically in their digestive system cows do as well they have a, a stomach called a rumen stomach that contains many uh, symbiotic microbes including chytrids zygomycota the bread moles this is a microscopic image magnified it i think probably about a hundred times something like that Okay, the glomeromycota live in a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. Okay, so here we see a plant root on the bottom, right? So these are the plant cells. And here we have a historia. This is the special type of historia, the special type, uh, the special type of plant uh, hyph uh, hyphae that is able to penetrate plant roots. And on the inside, the, the piece that gets stuck into the cell is called an arbuscule because it looks like a little bush. The word arbuscule translates as a little bush. So there's a scanning electron microscope image of an arbuscule pen penetrating inside the roots of a plant. The ascomycota, the cup fungi, so they you've heard of morels perhaps, uh, and truffles, right? So truffles are cup fungi, very expensive kind of fungi that's actually a delicacy in French food. You find them, usually these particular truffles, uh, well, anyway, truffles, you find them in the forest after a forest fire. So they're, they're kind of rare. Okay, so this is, this is the life cycle of a cup fungus, right? So you start out with the cup that disperses the spores in a big puff, and then they can either reproduce asexually or they can re reproduce sexually when you have two mating types, right? So you have, as usual, you have plasmogamy, karyogamy, and then meiosis, and then you produce a fruiting body that disperses the haploid spores again. Okay, so they can continue to reproduce asexually. Basidiomycota, the true mushrooms. So the mushroom cap is called a basidio cap, basidio carp rather, sorry. And it is used to disperse the spores which are referred to as basidiospores. Okay, so there's the life cycle again of a, of a basidiocarp. So you have the fungal colonies in the ground. If two fungal colonies that are the opposite mating types come across each other, they'll mate. You have plasmogamy and then karyogamy, and then you have the fruiting body, which is a basidiocarp. And if you look at the gills, these, these things underneath on the, on the undersurface of the mushroom that look like little vents, they're called literally called the gills. They are lined with the spores. That's what you. That's what's actually in the gills under the on the undersurface of the basidiocarp. Okay, there's a fairy circle, two colonies mate, mating there. All right, let's look at the ascomycota and the basidiomycota. Okay, so as I mentioned before, some of them are harmless and some of them are actually useful to us. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae, of course, is used to make bread bread, wine, beer, and so on. It's all fermented by Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is not a fungus. It's classified as a yeast. It's not dimorphic. It doesn't form mycelia, except under the special circumstances when you have it growing on a Petri plate. Okay, did you ever wonder why 
Alcoholic beverages like beer and wine have a 12.5% alcohol content. This is something I might ask you, but I, it's probably not for a lot of marks. This is this is something that a microbiologist should know, uh, particularly an industrial microbiologist should know this. And that is that when when um, uh, when Saccharomyces cerevisiae is growing under anaerobic conditions, it's it's taking the sugar out of the grape juice or out of the whatever whatever fruit or uh, vegetable beverage that you have. It's taking the sucrose and breaking it down into glucose and, and fructose, and then it's it's fermenting the glucose and producing ethanol. So uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what's called a homo uh, 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 homozygous uh, fermenter because it only produces one type of waste product and that single waste product is ethanol. There are some fungi and some yeasts that are totally unsuitable for this kind of thing because they produce ethanol and methanol. Ethanol is not a poison in small doses, it is in large doses, but it's not a poison in small doses, whereas methanol is a poison. Right? So if, you, if you're going to ferment beverages, you have to make sure that you have that that you actually inoculate it with Saccharomyces cerevisiae or some other microbe that you know only produces ethanol for the majority ethanol. If you ferment it with uh, some microbe that produces ethanol and methanol or primarily methanol, whatever you've made will be a poison, right? So, uh, fermentation technology, as it's called, is a biotechnology. Uh, biotechnology application of, of yeast, where you take very special yeasts, yeasts that you know only produce ethanol, and then you put them into various beverages and they ferment the sugar and produce ethanol. So, uh, you know, you could get the same thing if you just took grape juice and you dumped in ethanol. You didn't have to put the Saccharomyces cerevisiae in it, but but the Saccharomyces cerevisiae does give it a little bit of extra flavor because the, the yeast itself has a specific flavor. Uh, but anyway, why does it only have 12.5% 12, 12 alcohol usually when you see it on the shelf? If you go, if you go to the store and you see bottles of wine or, or bottles of beer, you look on the label, it says it has 12.5% alcohol concentration. That is because the, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae ferments the glucose until, and it puts out uh, alcohol until the alcohol content reaches 12.5%, which is lethal for the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Right? So I might ask you, what is the lethality level of ethanol for Saccharomyces cerevisiae? What concentration of ethanol will, will kill Saccharomyces cerevisiae? And the answer is 12.5%. So the, the, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is in the bottle and it, it is eating the glucose and producing methanol and uh, ethanol rather until the ethanol concentration reaches 12 and a half percent in which case in, at which time it dies and then you don't have to worry about it anymore and that's why you don't have you do not have live yeast in a bottle of wine because the yeast is killed off when the alcohol content reaches 12 and a half percent okay then if let's continue on if you're a, if you are an industrial microbiologist and you're you're producing alcoholic beverages that's your job then how do you make things like whiskey which is basically just uh, it, how do you get things like whiskey and vodka up to an alcohol concentration of 70 percent how do you do that well you take the beverage beer for example and you distill it that means if you remember from your chemistry class you heat it up and the alcohol will evaporate faster than the water so then you evaporate the alcohol out of it and then you condense the alcohol so you you evaporate the water or sorry you evaporate the alcohol out and then it comes over here and the alcohol gets condensed in this thing and then you have mainly the alcohol with a bit of the with a bit of the solution that came with it, and that is whiskey or vodka or whatever. Whether it's whiskey or vodka or something else depends on which of the alcoholic beverages that you that you uh, distilled. Right? So this is distillation, uh, and this is the way that you prepare those types of uh, liquors. Um, Hard, hard drinks. So you prepare them by, first you use Saccharomyces cerevisiae to ferment uh, fruit juice like grape juice or something else. And then you take that fermented uh, 
a liquid which has a 12.5% alcohol content, and then you distill it, and then you take the you take the co condensate that you've distilled, and it will have up to 70 or 80 or 90% alcohol with some of the some of the original flavor of the original beverage that you distilled. Okay, Aspergillus oryzae, right? It's it it also produces ethanol. It's used to make the classic Japanese Kikoman soy sauce, right? So this is the expensive soy sauce over here. It has a little bit of alcohol in it, thanks to the Aspergillus oryzae. Sake is a Japanese alcoholic beverage, which is produced by fermenting rice using Aspergillus oryzae. Okay, so Neurospora crassa, used by generations of geneticists to study chromosome mechanics and crossing over tetrad analysis, a type of an experimental technique called tetrad analysis. Tetrad analysis, very boring technique, is probably probably going to be obsolete as an experimental technique soon. Okay, so any of you that took Biology 234 might have used this textbook. This is one of the most famous textbooks in the world. I'm not going to ask you about this on a test. This is not part of the course. This is just an anecdote. But this is the most famous genetics textbook in the world. And we're fortunate in Vancouver that, the, that two of the authors of this textbook, Anthony Griffiths and David Suzuki, are professors at UBC. Maybe some of you want to go on to UBC and get a degree in biology. Um, David Suzuki is retired. Anthony Griffiths, I believe, is retired too, but I, I don't know if he still teaches that course. But uh, those are, so this is the most uh, famous genetics instruction book in the world, and it was written by two professors at UBC. Okay, so David Suzuki, you may know who he is because he has a television show on CBC called The Nature of Things. If you don't watch that show, I advise you to watch it because it's fascinating. If you're interested in biology, it's all about biology. So David Suzuki was originally a geneticist who worked with Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies. And then the other guy who did, to be honest, the other guy, Anthony Griffiths, did most of the work on the book. Uh, Anthony Griffiths is a... Is a uh, Neurospora crassa guy. So his, he spent his entire career studying cell division in Neurospora crassa. Right? So Anthony Griffith spent his whole career studying Neurospora crassa and doing tetrad analysis. David Suzuki spent his career when he was actually working as a scientist instead of a, instead of a TV star. He spent his career working with Drosophila melanogaster as a fruit flies as a model organism. There, there is Suzuki in his youth handling the fruit flies. And he has this show called The Nature of Things, which I advise you to watch. Okay, so that was just a little side note. But Neurospora crassa is important because it's used. it has been used for many generations to study cell char characteristics of cells. And of course, Penicillium chrysogenum, it, is, it looks like this, and uh, it, it was the source of the original antibiotic. This thing here uh, is where somebody has streaked a Staphylococcus aureus onto a Petri plate and then put a, put a fungal colony there, put a, a fungal cell there, and where the fungal colony grew, the Staphylococcus aureus could not grow. Notice that there's what's known as a clearance zone, clearance zone around the fungal colony, where some chemical is put into the environment that's inhibiting the growth of the fungus. Right. And uh, so, so that's where we discovered the first antibiotics. By the way, the clearance zone is very critical because we use it in a test called the Kirby-Bauer test, which we're going to talk about in, uh, in Unit 12, or uh, Unit 13, sorry. And the, the Kirby-Bauer test is where you take an antibiotic and you soak a piece of filter paper, a little tiny disk of filter paper in that antibiotic, and then you put it onto a Petri plate that has been completely covered with bacteria, and then you measure how big the clearance zone is, in order to see how how deadly that antibiotic is to this particular bacteria. So this is against uh, Streptococcus, uh, sorry, Staphylococcus aureus, and you see that methicillin has a big clearance zone. This one over here is an antibiotic called vancomycin, and then this one here is an antibiotic called ampicillin, and this one here is just water, which is the experimental control. So you notice that the water didn't 
didn't really kill any of the bacteria. But the methicillin, the vancomycin, and the ampicillin all have a clearance zone around them where they killed the bacteria. So this is, this is a, a, a test called the clearance zone test, or the, also known as the Kirby-Bauer test, which is a way of analyzing and measuring how effective different antibiotics are at killing a particular bacteria. So you don't need to memorize that for the quizzes in the near future, but we will be returning to this idea of the Kirby-Bauer test later. Okay, let's look at some specific pathogenic ascomycota and basidiomycota. All right, so some of them have localized growth on the skin, dermatophytes, and some of them are systemic or inhaled. Right? And we talked about the fact that the spores are quite allergenic and they can cause inflammation right? and some of them produce toxins. So a localized infection is caused by fungi that are classified as dermatophytes. Dermatoph the word phyte is a word means plant. Dermato, of course, refers to the dermis or the epidermis, right? So the diseases, scalp ringworm, jock itch, athlete's foot, and, sp and uh, sporotrichosis are three, exa three examples, four examples actually, of localized dermatophyte infections. Um, Actually, sporotrichosis is not a dermatophyte infection. It's an infection of the lymphatic system, but I'll get to that. We're going to learn about histoplas histoplasmosis and coccidio coccidiomycosis, uh, which are systemic infections. And then we have our old friends, the opportunistic infections, which will only harm you or will only infect you if you are weakened or if there's, some, if there's been some change in your body or if the normal microbiome of your body has been disrupted in some way. Okay, let's start with the dermatophyte infections. Okay, so here's the skin. This, the top part of your skin is referred to as the epidermis. The middle part is referred to as the dermis, right? So this, these are the two areas, mainly the epidermis, where dermatophytes like to feed. Okay, so Candida albicans is an opportunistic infection, right? It can cause oral thrush by growing on the tongue, and it can cause vulvovaginal candidiasis, or commonly known as a yeast infection, if, usually if the woman has had a course of antibiotics uh, that kills off the normal lactobacillus acidophilus in the vagina. Trichophyton tonsarans is, a, is an ascomycete that causes tinea capitis, which is called ringworm, scalp ringworm. You can remember that it infects the scalp because it has the word cap in it. Cap, you think of a, something that you put on your head. And then trichophyton rubrum, the word rubrum means red. So tinea pettis is where you have these itchy, blistered red feet, athlete's foot. If you get it in the groin area, instead it's, it's referred to as tinea cruris or jock itch. And then sporothrix shenkai is a subcutaneous infection. Subcutaneous means under the skin. The word cutaneous means skin, sub means underneath. Uh, and you get something called ascending lymphangitis. So the, those of you who remember first year, you have the lymph nodes, which are uh, located along the lymphatic vesicles, lymph lymphatic ducts. And so sporothri sporothrix shenkai causes, it, it usually get, you know, you puncture your hand uh, or you puncture your finger on a thorn from your rose garden. It gets into your hand and then the fungus starts traveling up your arm through the lymphatic ducts and the, lymph the uh, lymph nodes are trying to kill it at every checkpoint along the way, and they swell up and they form these things that are called granulomas. And so these granulomas are swollen lymph nodes. Uh, and so this is sometimes referred commonly, referred to commonly as a rose gardener's disease. All right, beware some dangerous images. Okay, on the, this is Candida albicans, and uh, on the right we have a, uh, an example of oral thrush. So make sure you know what the word thrush means. The, co the technical term is, is mucocutaneous candidiasis, commonly known as an oral thrush. And so a thrush is where you have yeast, particularly uh, Candida albicans, growing on your tongue. 
and of course vulvovaginal candidiasis, we already know about that. Trichophyton tonsorans, ringworm. Tinea pettis, caused by Trichophyton rubrum, as well as Tinea cruris. Okay, so this is itchy athlete's foot. Uh, the athlete's foot spray contains the same chemical as monostat, which is used for vulvovaginal candidiasis. And then this is how you catch it. Athletes wandering around the locker room with bare feet. One of them has uh, one of them has athlete's foot. Pretty soon they'll all have it. Luckily, these these guys are not as stupid as they may look. They are. Uh, all wearing sandals, you notice. So they're not walking around barefoot in the locker room. That's a bad idea. So if you go to a gymnasium or to a swimming pool and you, you're in the changing room, it's a good idea not to, not to sit on the bench unless you have a towel or something underneath you, and it's a good idea to wear sandals on your feet so you're not walking on the floor. Okay, if you end up getting the fungus on your groin area instead of your feet, it's referred to as jock itch, which is the uh, technical term is tinea cruris. Sporoth Sporothrix shenkai, Rose Gardner's disease, you have ascending lymphangitis. So, the, 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 so here we have a nice, lovely lady who is probably gardening with her, her pulling thorns out of her rose garden or something, and she got pricked by a thorn, which allowed Sporothrix shenkai to get in subcutaneously down here. And then as it tried to travel upwards through the lymphatic system, the, the lymph nodes are swelling up at every point along the way to try and stop it. Okay, Sub, uh, rather uh, parenteral infection by Sporothrix shenkai, parenteral, meaning you pricked yourself with thorns usually. Okay, respiratory infections that lead to systemic infections by members of the ascomycota. Right, so histoplasma capsulatum causes histoplasmosis. It usually comes because you inhaled spores from soil or from bird or from bat droppings. This, this, is, this condition is endemic to Ohio and the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, which are located in the eastern United States. We don't really have to worry too much about this in British Columbia, for instance, but there are parts of the world where they do worry about it. And coccidioides imitus causes coccidiomycosis, which is where, you again, you inhale spores from the soil or from bird droppings or from bat droppings. This is mostly in California and a few other places. Right? And it usually infects the lungs, but sometimes it can spread to the blood, and sometimes it causes an infection of the skin as well. Histoplasma capsulatum. Right, so you can get it by cleaning out an attic that's filled with bats and therefore bat droppings. These are the areas where we have to worry about it. Also, if you're in one of these areas digging a trench to put in a pipe or something like that, you have reason to be worried about that. If you raise birds or if you have contact with lots of birds, lots of pigeons in your attic or something like that that you're trying to clean up after, you can inhale the spores as well. Or if you raise chickens on an unregulated farm or something like that, you could inhale histoplasma capsulatum spores. Right, so amateur chicken farmers have to worry about this as well. If you have an attic full of pigeons and you're cleaning it out, you have to worry about it as well. You should be wearing a respirator mask and goggles so that you don't inhale them or get them in your eyes, the spores. Bats do the same thing. Uh, sometimes you have an infestation of bats in a barn or in, in your, the attic of your house if there's some entry where they can get in. Uh, that's why it's always good to uh, uh, inspect your attic and make sure there's nothing like that living in there and make sure that there are no holes in the uh, in the wood frame of the house so that they can get in. Okay, bats. Okay, these are the areas, the general area where you have to worry about histoplasma capsulatum. Coccidioides imitus, you have to worry about it in this area. It's endemic to these areas of the of North America. Right. And then you can see that the dispersal pattern is a little bigger than I showed you in the previous two maps. Okay, what about eating toxins? Okay, so Aspergillus flavus produces aflatoxin B1, which causes liver cancer. Uh, 
So that's at, that's not our that's not our boy. That's Aspergillus nigillans. Here we have Aspergillus flavus. Here we have Aspergillus flavus again. Okay, so here we have a flooded house, and when the water resides, the the drywall was the drywall was wet enough that this happened. At this point, it doesn't make sense to try and repair the the damage from the mold. It makes sense because it'll never be never really be safe to inhabit again. Uh, but you can try, but it's a, usually a futile gesture. And so if you get somebody to tear out the moldy dry drywall, they have to be properly equipped with personal protective equipment or PPE. Basidio mycota. Okay, so Cryptococcus neoformans is one of the rare forms of members of the Basidio mycota that doesn't, it's, it's a yeast that's a member of that phylum. Uh, it, you can find it again in pigeon droppings, so it gets into the brain through the olfactory bulb, which is the thing that we use to smell. And then Amanita muscaria is one of the toadstools there are, that produce a bunch of different toxins that are referred to as hepatotoxins. So the aflatoxin B1 is, is a member of the family of hepatotoxins. The word hepato, the word hepato refers to the liver, and so these are toxins that affect the liver. Not, they don't necessarily affect the liver. They often cause cancer some, someplace else, but they are converted from a harmless chemical into a carcinogen, a, chem, a, a cancer-causing chemical, by transiting through the liver because the liver causes a lot of chemical reactions to occur. So the liver actually, liver, ironically, the liver is meant to detoxify toxins that we eat. But in some cases like this, it actually turns something from being non-toxic into, into being toxic. And that's part of a, bran a branch of biology called toxicology. Uh, it's the study of poisons and how they affect the human body, as well as things that are not poisonous to begin with, but are converted into poisons by the human body. Now, one of the interesting things about Amanita muscaria and other toadstools is that many of them are deadly. They are deadly like Amanita muscaria, but there are other members of the same genus that are not that produce poisons that don't quite kill you. Instead of killing you, they just make you hallucinate. Right? And so there are people who actually go out, foolishly in my opinion, uh, and dangerously, who go out and collect what, what are commonly known as magic mushrooms. And this was something that happened during the 60s when we had hippies that were looking for, that were experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs like LSD and other things like that. One of the things they discovered was that that, that some mushrooms will make you hallucinate. And then you, you eat these mushrooms and you have a, a, a bizarre, interesting experience. But you have, to, you have to know your mushrooms very well because members of the Amanita genus, many of them are deadly, whereas other ones are only somewhat deadly and cause you to hallucinate rather than just die. <laughs> so I wouldn't mess around with, with uh, magic mushrooms at all. Okay, so Cryptococcus neoformans can cause meningitis, inflammation of the membranes that surround the brain, right? You get it by inhaling it. You can get it from bird droppings usually. So bird droppings are particularly bad because they often contain these fungal spores. Okay, these are the areas where you have to worry about Cryptococcus neoformans. Most of the world, in fact, not in North America or, or Russia, but most of the, West, most of the rest of the world. Amanita muscaria, deadly poisons produce hepatotoxins. Right? As I said, we have all these children's stories where we have colorful, funny little creatures living inside these mushrooms, but they're actually deadly. So the, the cartoon, people who draw cartoons should probably think of somewhere else to put the gnomes and the smurfs instead of Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Okay, so in the 60s, we had hippies who were experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs and they discovered that LSD, uh, a, a, an experimental drug in, from the 60s, causes you to hallucinate, commonly called acid, LSD. And so they would drop acid and have hallucinogenic experiences. They call it a trip. That was trippy. Uh, 
And then they also discovered that certain types of mushrooms will make you hallucinate as well, but you have to know the poisonous ones from the ones that are merely hallucinogenic. So you have to be an expert. I would never recommend that anyone do that because it's very dangerous. And um, yeah, so hallucinogenic mushrooms. All right, so in this particular lecture, we learned about the terminology for fungi. We learned what mycology is, what a mycosis is, and what mycoses are. We learned about the differences between yeast and fungi, mainly one is dimorphic, the other is not. We learned about the mating types of fungi as well as the mating type switch. We learned about what plasmogamy, karyogamy, and fruiting bodies are. We learned about hyphae, septate versus synocytic hyphae. We learned what a mycelium is. We learned what, what fungal colonies look like. Uh, we learned about the spores that are dispersed from the fruiting body. We learned about certain fungi that live in symbiotic relationships with plants, though, and they produce hyphae that are referred to as a hystorium, and then they stick a little thing called an arbuscule into the cell, into the root cells of a plant, and that's how they uh, carry out the exchange. Uh, we learned that fungi have ergosterol and the fungi and yeast both have ergosterol in their cell plasma membrane, which is the way we attack them with drugs that will affect uh, 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 the drugs that will kill only the fungus and leave the human alone. We know that they are dispersers. They're some of the few creatures on earth that can that can decompose cellulose. And then we learned about the fungal pathologies. The chitin that fungi have in their cell wall is very, is very allergenic. Some of them produce aflatoxins that can cause liver cancer. Some of, them, uh, some of them will infect your skin. They will cause a superficial mycosis. Some of them infect your system, so they cause systemic mycoses. So we learned about the we learned about the five important phyla of fungi. You do need to know the five phyla and which of the example fungi that we learned belong to which phylum. We learned about the useful ascomycetes that we use to make beer and wine and sake that we use to study cell division and that we use to generate penicillin as well as some other antibiotics. We learned about the ascomyco ascomycetes that are pathogenic, Candida albicans. You know, so I, we've talked about Candida albicans a lot this semester, but I could at this point now I could start asking you which phylum it belongs to. It belongs to the to the Ascomycota phylum, and then we learned the names of a bunch of new ones. And we learned about some, some pathogenic members of the phylum Basidiomycota, which are the true fungi, uh, true mushrooms, except that one of the one of the pathogenic ones that's a member of that phylum, Cryptococcus neoformans, is not actually a mushroom. So that's one of the exceptional ones. Okay, just to finish off. Normally, algae is not studied by microbiologists, although it can be. But it's but it, it, it's more important to the subject of protistology. So we discuss we discussed uh, important algae like the dinoflagellites and the diatoms in the section on protistology. Let me just say a word about lichens. I will never test you about lichens, but you need to know what it is just because if you're going to be a biologist, you need to know what a lichen is. It's a very important type of an organism, if you're, especially if you're an ecologist. Okay, so uh, people who study ecology and botany are more interested in lichens, but what a lichen is, is it's a symbolic, it's a, a sorry, <laughs> it's a symbiotic mixture of algae and fungi. Right, so they, they both benefit from this. The algae, algae are photosynthetic, so they can produce, they can harvest energy from light and use it to make, and they can also harvest carbon from the atmosphere. And so they can use the carbon gas from the atmosphere and the, sun, and the energy from sunlight to make polysaccharides. They can use it to make glucose. Fungi, on the other hand, are not photosynthetic, and they need nutrients, they need glucose. And so what happens is if you just purely by chance, you get a mixture of a, a particular type of algae and a particular type of fungus, you've created a lichen. And why this is interesting is because lichens have the ability to grow in places that nothing else can grow, right? So a, a lichen can literally grow on a rock, but no other life form can, right? So fungi can't grow on a rock because there are no nutrients. 
and algae can, alone algae alone cannot grow on a rock because it's too dry but what happens is that the that what they both get out of this symbiotic relationship is that the fungi tend to be moist and they absorb moisture and the algae need the moisture and they produce the glucose right so the the fungi provide a nice moist atmosphere for the algae to live in and the algae provide the glucose which they make from the sunlight and that's what a lichen is so the reason why this is important is because number one they can grow in parts of the world in in environments that nothing else can grow in and they are part of what's known as ecological succession. So when you have a new landscape created through a volcanic eruption or something like that, it's all rock. What's the first thing that's going to grow on the rock? The only thing that can grow on it are the lichens. So you have a period of 20 or 30 years or 40 years where just lichens are growing on top of the rock. And then those lichens, which are life forms, they will die and they'll start to rot. And then you can get other types of plants growing on the lichens. And eventually you will get this, uh, you will build up a layer of humus. An organ, uh, you know, humus, of course, is organic material from rotting vegetation. And then other life forms can grow in that. So whenever a new landscape is created through an earthquake or a volcanic eruption or something like that, or the landscape that was there was destroyed, it gets all burnt out by a forest fire or something. Then you say, what is the first life form that will reappear in that area? The first life form will be, generally will be lichens, and they will occupy the area for a long time. And then usually, uh, usually uh, moss, mosses, bryophytes will, will move in. And then other types of plants, angiosperms will move in and gymnosperms. And then animals will move in to eat the plants. And then you have an ecosystem again. So the term succession means what comes next, you know, what's this after that, this after that. So the, so lichens are very important to the uh, science of studying ecological succession in the environment. Okay, so ecological succession, if an ecosystem is destroyed by a forest fire or a new one is created by volcanic activity, then you have the primary succession, the first life to move in is usually like lichens. Right? So there's no dirt, there's no soil for other plants to grow, but those lichens will eventually die and decompose and become the soil for the new life forms to grow in as well, other life forms to grow as well. Right? So here you have some rocks and these things that you've, that you've walked by most of your life and assumed it was moss, now you know that it's not moss, these are lichens. Right? So the, these, these kind of, moss usually has a layer of soil under it, but lichens are growing directly on the rock. So these are these beautiful things are growing on rocks. These are lichens. Okay, so if you have a volcanic eruption and suddenly you have an area where there's nothing but rock after the lava cools off. All right, so the lava will eventually cool off. What's the first thing that's going to grow on that after the lava cools off? Here we have a recent volcano eruption and then the lava cooled off and then after a few years you get this. So the first thing that you see growing is are the lichens. And they're, they're quite pretty because some of these lichens are formed from green algae and fungi and some are formed from red algae and fungi and different things. And so depending on which combination of fungi and algae got together, that will determine which lichen it is. And there are many, there are many different lichens. Okay, so if you see things growing on the, sh on, on the roof tiles of your house, you know the roof tiles are made of a petroleum product that nothing can really grow in. So basically they're just growing on the roof of the house the same way they would grow on a rock. These are lichens that are on the roof of your house. These are lichens that are growing on the bark of this tree on the right. right? So houses that are located near the ocean will often have lichens growing on them. Uh, you'll see a lot of lichens growing on wood structures around Vancouver. All right, so thank you very much. That's our lecture on fungi. And then after this, we're going to move on to viruses, which is a and the subject of virology, which is a different subject entirely because viruses are not actually living things. They are obligate intracellular parasites. And so we're going to move on to viruses next. Okay, thank you very much.